Praise the Lord. Give me a revival. Hallelujah. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you tonight for what we have heard. We know that everyone will experience and also will demonstrate your power in every life in Jesus' name. Tonight, open our eyes of understanding. Help us, Lord, to behold wondrous things out of your word. And we pray, Lord, that this love, love divine, love like the love of Christ, love the love of God, will be implanted in every heart, every life, every family, every minister, every member of our church, in Jesus' name. Confirm your word in every life tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Tonight we're looking at 1 John chapter 3. I'm reading from verse 11. 1 John chapter 3, verse 11. For this is the message that ye heard from the beginning, that we shall love one another. That we shall love one another. Let's come to chapter 4, verse 7. In 1 John chapter 4, verse 7, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. And everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. Tonight, the title of the message is Practical Christ-like Love from Transformed Hearts. Practical Christ-like Love from transformed hearts. Tonight, we are going to break the message into four parts. One, two, three, tell me, four. Number one, pure, meaningful love among true followers. It's true followers. Pure, meaningful love among his true followers. When we say we're Christians, when we say we're Christian ministers, and when we say we're followers of Christ, he imparts his nature, his nature of love into us. And that love is pure. That love is meaningful. That love is manifold. That love is many-sided. That love is mindful of other people. And whatever we do, we do it in love as Christ would have done it. Point number two. Perverted, mindless love of friendly force. They act friendly. They act lovingly. They act as if they like us. But they are foes. They are enemies. And their love is mindless, thoughtless, and is perverted. Number two, perverted, mindless love of friendly foes. Point number three, permanent mutual love in the family. If you say you love the brethren, charity begins at home. Charity love begins between husband and wife, parents and children, and also the members of the household. And such love is not temporary. Such love is not like Okay, I love her today. She loves me today because, um, you know, I brought money home. Or I couldn't, uh, you know, do this. But the love is mutual. From husband to wife. From wife to husband. From parents to children. From children to parents. Among all the members of the family. And it's permanent. It's not that during courtship you love one another so much, you talk together, you discuss together, you are friendly, and everything was okay. And then after a few months into the marriage, 
that we cannot see the love again. It's evaporated. It's permanent. It's mutual in the family. Point number four. Profitable ministerial love for the flock. The flock of God. Fear not, little flock. It is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. And we ministers then come around and we impart the love of God into the members, the whole flock. And we make sure that we're moving everyone towards the kingdom. Profitable ministerial love for the flock. I come to point number one. Pure, meaningful love among his true followers. We're looking at First John chapter 3. And I read that verse 11 again. For this is the message that ye heard from the beginning that we shall love one another. Look at verse 16. Hereby perceive we the love of God because he laid down his love for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. You see that it's pure, it's practical, it's visible, it's manifested. And we ought to do what Christ has done. When Christ laid down his life for us, it was something practical. It wasn't only prophetic. It wasn't only in a promissory note. It wasn't theoretical. It wasn't just verbal. It wasn't just uh, professional. I love you, I love you, I love you. I love the members of the church. I love our church. I love everyone in the church. I love the programs. I love the doctrine. It wasn't just verbal. It wasn't theoretical. It was something practical and pure. And hereby perceive we the love of God because he laid down his life for us. What have you laid down recently for the brethren? In what way have you shown that your love is pure, your love is practical, and you laid something down? Did you lay down your will? Did you lay down the things you like? I like to do things this way. But doing it that way doesn't benefit the church. Doing it that way doesn't excite us and it doesn't turn us on to be our best. You must lay down anything and everything that will hinder the joy, the progress, and the upliftment of the believers. And it says, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren, for the brethren. Lay down our lives for the brethren, our time for the brethren, our money for the brethren, our resources for the brethren, anything that our life has acquired. Because when it says life, your time, that's part of your life, and the things you earn, and the things you possess through that life, and through your skill, we ought to lay down everything for the brethren. Verse 17, but whoso has this world's good. You have intelligence, you have wisdom, you have skill, you have material things, you have some good things, you have learning, you have experience, and you have the know-how. Whoso has this world's good and seeth his brother have need, and CS members of the church have need, and CS ministers of the church have need, and CS our leaders have need, and shortest up his bowels of compassion from him. Many times 
from what people say, from what people discuss, you will know he has this need. And you know, I happen to have abundance of that thing that he needs. And this one talks and that one talks and we know there's no secret. He needs this. She needs that. It says, if we short a bowels of compassion from him, from her, how dwelleth the love of God in him. Now, we have read and we have learned from the words of Jesus Christ. When you do your arms, when you give your gifts, do not let your right hand know what your left hand is doing. You are not publicizing anything. You will give and you give generously and cheerfully. Let me give you a testimony. Is that all right? I can't hear you. When I was a new believer, it was that same year I went to university and I had a classmate. And that classmate, all the money he had, somebody stole the money. And he came to the room and said, called my name and said, you know what happened? I've lost all my money. Somebody, a thief, a wicked person. How am I going to live now? How do I continue to buy my books and to buy this and to buy that? All the money is gone. Oh, I said, sorry. But I knew that I had money. And he was, you know, we were roommate, but not classmate. What I mean is roommate, but he was studying another subject. And then I took money to the post office and I bought money order, large amount, and I wrote his name and I posted it to him. Remember, on the same room, I could have given him directly. I didn't want to do that. I wanted to obey the words of Christ. Let not your right hand know what your left hand is doing. The uh, two days after, he got money order. And then he called me. He said, you know, as I told you two days ago, that man that stole my money, he felt guilty. And see what he has done now. Instead of coming directly to me, you know what he did? He brought money, he bought money order. And then he brought the money order out of the envelope and showed me. Oh, I said, we well, thank God. I didn't tell him, it's not the one who stole your money. I didn't steal your money. But you know, when we have what we can supply others, we do not wait. We do it to the glory of God, and we do it like Christ has done it. God will help us. We will not wait until people know that I am the one, you are the one supporting them in our church here in Deeper Life. When we started, the love of God was full, overflowing. And in the offering a box that we put at the back of the auditorium at that time, you'll find envelopes for brother so-and-so, envelopes for sister so-and-so. Believers, genuine believers, they began to offer what they will do for other people. Those days will start again. So we come to church, we hear the word of God. And then we pray that God will supply our need. And before we go back home, something from the offering bag, where our name has been written, it will be sent to us in Jesus' name. You know what I discovered today? What I discovered today is that people give this already rich. Brother so-and-so happens to be having birthday. And he's rich. He has too much money already. And then we we'll remember brother so-and-so, sister so-and-so's birthday, and we we'll send money, we we'll send money. 
There are people dying. There are people hungry. There are people starving. It's okay to give anything to anybody, but remember in particular the fatherless. Remember the widows. Remember the poor. Remember the jobless. And God will bless you for it in Jesus' name. But say, Chin, my little children, let us not love in word, in theory, by profession, talk of mouth, neither in tongue, but in deed and uh, in truth. You will love. I will love. And our love will be practical in Jesus' name. Let's remember John chapter 15. John chapter 15. And I'm reading from verse 12. John chapter 15, verse 12. This is my commandment. That's Christ talking to you, talking to me, talking to us. That she love one another as I, as I, as I have loved you. Greater love as no man than this, that a man should lay down his life for his friends. Now if we say believers are our friends, and those believers, the landlord is rejecting them. And we have heard about it because we are friends. And we have the money stashed in the bank, and we cannot go and withdraw that money and rescue that family how dwelleth the love of God in us? Your friend as a child in the school, in the college, and um, you just find that the child is at home, and it's not holiday time, and you see the child every time, you didn't even ask any question. If it's your friend, a fellow brother, a fellow sister, a family friend, a member of the church, ask question. It's not only the time yet. What's the boy doing at home? Then they will tell you, and God will use you. That boy will be educated. That daughter will be educated. And it is when we do that, the love of God is in us. That love will be practical. Some years ago, it's many, many years now actually, one of our sisters was going on the street and saw that a girl was there just standing by the roadside. She went away, that is her sister, and then coming back through that road again, that girl was still there. And so the sister said, ah, you girl, what's your name? She mentioned her name. I saw you here when I was going to buy something over there, and you're still standing here. What's the problem? She said, I'm afraid to cross the road. My father said, my mother is a witch, and drove my mother out. My father then turned to me and said, because you are a girl, you have got what was in your mother and drove me out and said, wherever you go, we don't care. Go and die. And since my own father called me a witch, that's why I'm standing here. I'm afraid to cross the road. That sister took her and then brought her to me. And eventually we said, we are going to find accommodation for her. So we found accommodation for her. And eventually, I think she was seeing a GS2 or 3 at that time. We sent her back to school. She finished her school search. We sent her, when I say we, actually I, through the church. And we made sure she finished NCE. When she finished NCE, she still wanted to go on. And I said, go and tell your father you are still alive. And then she went to the father, and the father saw her. I said, where are you coming from? Where are you living? What do you have now? And she said, I finished secondary school, 
and now I have NCE and I'm about to go for your service and all that. And the father now appreciated what the church had done because that child would have been a wasted child. We can help and you can help. I said you can help. The church, the local church can do it. The group church can do it. And the central church, if we know, we can do it. Our members will not die for lack of care in Jesus' name. God will use you. God will use me. We're coming to point number two now. Perverted, mindless love of friendly force. They are force, but they act friendly. So that they can deceive the people they want to injure, they want to harm. Look at First John chapter 3. First John chapter 3. I'm reading from verse 12. Not as Cain, who was of that wicked one, and slew his brother. And wherefore slew he him? Because his own works were evil, and his brother's righteous. Marvel not, my brethren, if the world hates you, we know that we have passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother, tell me, abideth in death. Verse 15, whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer. And ye know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. The apostle, by the Spirit, was talking of love, pure love, practical love, profitable love, a kind of love that impacts the lives of other people positively. And then he brings in Cain. Why Cain? Look at Genesis chapter 4. Genesis chapter 4, reading from verse 3. And in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. The ground was cursed, and the fruit had been cursed too. And he brought the accursed sin to appease God. That's why I was rejected. And Abel, he also brought of the firstlings of the flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and his offering. The Lord accepted that offering because it had blood. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. And Abel brought that lamb from the flock so that that lamb or that kid will be a substitute. He should have died. Abel now accepted, O oh Lord, I marriage, the death penalty. But let this animal replace me. That's what you did for daddy and mommy. That's what you did for Adam and Eve. And so the Lord accepted him. But Cain and his offering to them, to him, he had no respect. And Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. And the Lord said unto Cain, why art thou wroth? Why is thy countenance falling? If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, sin lies at the door. There is a sin offering lying at the door. You can take that and you'll have your second chance. And unto thee, Shall, is, shall be his desire, 
and thou shalt rule over him. And Cain talked with Abel, his brother. Cain talked with Abel, his brother. He didn't show his real feeling. He didn't show his intention. He didn't show the murderous thoughts in his heart. Cain talked with his brother. His face appeared friendly. It's like, you are my brother. How do you feel now that your offering was accepted? How do you feel now that you offered an acceptable offering? And Cain and Abel opened up and said, you know, I got that from what happened to our father and our mother, Adam and Eve. How God slew an animal and covered them with the skin of the animal. And Cain listened. And it wasn't, uh, Abel did not think anything bad was going to happen. And it came to pass. That means after some time. When they were in the field, Abel did not avoid Cain because he didn't know anything bad was going to happen. Cain rose up against Abel, his brother. What did he do? Let me hear you now. And slew him. We're coming to Hebrews chapter 11. And we're reading from verse 4. Hebrews chapter 11 I read from verse 4. By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. Abel offered by faith. Cain was faithless. He didn't manifest any faith. And when the Lord talked to him, he didn't take correction. He didn't say, okay, if that's not acceptable, and what my brother has offered is what's acceptable, I'm going to now turn around, and I'm going to do the right thing. No, he would not. And it says in that verse 4, that by which Abel obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it he being dead yet speaketh. Jude, only one chapter, Jude chapter 1, and I'm reading from verse 11, Jude chapter 1, reading from verse 11, still talking about Cain and others like Cain. In Jude verse 11, warned to them, they have gone in the way of Cain, and they ran greedily after the arrow of Balaam for a word, and they perished in the gainsaying of Corey. These are spots in your feast of charity. When they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear, clouds they are without water, carried about with winds, trees whose fruit withereth, without fruit, twice dead, plucked up by the roots, reaching waves of the sea, forming out their own shame, wandering stars, to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness, how long? Forever. Cain and all who follow in the footsteps of Cain. That's why John, the beloved by the Spirit, says, we're talking about love, agape love. Abundant love, overflowing love, Christ-like love, practical love, not as Cain. How was uh, the love of Cain that didn't make Abel to suspect anything was going to happen in the bad sense? Cain's love was an 
a superficial sin covering number one anger in the heart it was wrath it was angry angry not only that bitter Cain was bitter bitter against God and bitter against his brother and Cain you understand you should understand Cain what happened was not Abel's fault and Cain's superficial love had underground cruelty he was angry he was bitter he was cruel he was deceptive he deceived Abel into thinking come on share with me how do you feel how about your sacrifice? How did you get that idea that you'll sacrifice like that? And it was deceptive. It was asking as if he was going to do it. It was evil. In fact, the Bible says he was evil. If he was forceful. He was a person that exercised force. He didn't know how to relate with another person in a good way, in a friendly way, in an amicable manner. All he knew to use was false, forceful. He was grudging. He grudged Abel because Abel's sacrifice had been acceptable to God. And there are people that carry chiefs of grudge in their, on their shoulder, in their mind, in their heart, everywhere. And whatever good thing Abel is saying, they can't recognize. Whatever good thing Abel is doing, they cannot recognize. They have such deep grudges. Age was hard-hearted. They were the first two children born to their fathers to their father and their mother. And looking at that Abel, that was his only brother. And if this one is gone, you'll be alone. But his heart, heart blinded him. Heart hearted. He was insensitive. Nobody had ever killed another person. Nobody had ever seen any other person die. And yet, Cain thought about what to do. He must have done it in a very terrible, bad way. Since nobody had ever killed another person, and he wanted to do it, if he knocked him this way and he didn't die, knocked him another way, and poor Abel was crying. That didn't move him. He was insensitive. There are people that, although they, man they say they love, they hurt other people, they pressure other people, they make lives painful for other people, and even when the other person, the oppressing is crying, or he is complaining, or he is saying, this is heavy. This is disturbing me. In fact, they take joy in seeing tears, came to joy in seeing blood, in city. It was jealous. It was because of the jealousy. That's why he rose up and pounced on him. Because Abel's sacrifice had been accepted. His own rejected jealousy. Jealousy brings pretending love, perverted love, hypocritical love. Because he's jealous of that person, he wants that. If he doesn't want him to die, he wants his project to die. He wants his joy to die. He wants his courage to die. He wants his conviction to die. He wants every good thing concerning him to die. Jealous. Okay. It's like kissing to kill. 
kissing to kill. My brother, how are you today? My brother, how's life going on with you? And it's like he loves him, he'll embrace him, he'll kiss him only to kill El lawless. He wasn't under the law of God. Cain, where is your brother? I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? He wasn't under any control of the Lord. He didn't see God as creator. He was lawless. M. Murmuring. Why shouldn't he accept my sacrifice? I'm the senior brother. I came first. And whatever I offered, that, that's, it came from my heart. And that's all I could do. And so why did God not accept that? Murmuring. Narrow-minded. Narrow-minded. He thought killing another person will make him happy. Making somebody cry will make him joyful. Making somebody unhappy, gloomy, will make him glad. He thought, the more you make other people sorrowful and sad, the more you'll be happy. Cain, life doesn't work that way. Actually, you reap what you sow. You make other people unhappy, you too, you'll be unhappy. In fact, you might be unhappy for all eternity. Narrow-minded. Cain was obstinate. The Lord want him. Cain, what are you doing what you're doing? Why are you angry? Look at the sin offering. You can go and take that sin offering, but what you will do, he will do. No prayer. No asking God for counsel. No saying, God, okay, you are talking to me, thank you. What do I do now? He was so obstinate, his will took the better part and the worst part of him. He was possessive, possessive. It's like Abel is not just my brother and I possess him. If I want him to be happy, yes, he'll be happy. If I want him to be sorrowful, he must be sorrowful. I possess the man. I possess the woman. I possess its destiny. And if anything happens that he's going to go ahead of me, since I possess him, I possess his life, I cut off his life. Possess him. Cain was quarrelsome without any reason. Abel had nothing against him. Abel did not even ridicule him. Abel did not even touch or taunt him that, see what you have done. You are not accepted before God. Even though you are my senior brother, you are still rejected. Abel did not do that. But the man had a nature of being quarrelsome. He was revengeful or nothing revengeful or nothing. He was serpentine, 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 like a serpent walking, wriggling on the green grass and you will not know that he has poison and that once he bites, that's deadly serpentine. He was troublesome. Abel could not live at peace and enjoy is accepted offering, but now Cain must trouble him in the heart, trouble him in the mind, trouble his life. He was ungodly, an ungodly man. And without seeing any example of killing any other person, he killed Cain. He was violent, a violent man. The violence was in his mind. And until he unleashed that violence on the nearest person to him, he could not stop. And yet, he spoke to Abel. And it was like, we're friendly. It was like, you're my brother. It was like, that's right, that's right. You're lucky, you're fortunate, you're accepted, I'm rejected. He was wicked. 
wicked. And he was also xenophobic. Xenophobic, that means you see another race because you know the Lord that told Adam and Eve replenish, reproduce, and fill up the earth. And Cain was to fill up the earth on this side. Abel, fill up the earth on this side. He caught down Abel and his posterity. Xenophobic. He yielded to strive. Yielding to strive. You see, when somebody is just superficially loving, when strife or temptation to strive comes, they yield. I pray you will not yield. And then it was zigzag. You couldn't tell. It comes this way. Before you look up, it's turned another bend. Before you think of where is he going, it goes another way. And before you are able to decipher and uh, you are able to discern what he is about, it's gone another way. Zigzag, zigzag. There are people like that. Their moods are zigzag. Their attitude, zigzag. Their action, zigzag. Their relationship, zigzag. You couldn't depend on them. They wake up in the morning and then the wife has not done anything or said anything wrong. And they're angry. Why? I don't know. They don't probably know. And then after 10 minutes, they come back and they say, my wife, how are you? And the wife is confused. How is the man like this? Or maybe he's a woman at you know, a particular point. My husband, the only man in the world I love. Thank God I got married to you. The best decision I ever took in my life is that you are my husband. And then about one hour later, nothing has happened. It's like depression. And then they come and say, you are the one disturbing my progress. You are the one that is cutting me down. You are the one that will not make me make progress. You are the one, in fact, I don't know why I got married to you. Why? Zigzag. The Lord deliver us. I said, the Lord deliver us. The Lord deliver every one of us in Jesus' name. Not as Cain. Angry. Bitter cruel, deceptive, evil, forceful, grudging, at-hearted, insensitive, jealous, kissing to kill, lawless, murmuring, narrow-minded, obstinate, possessive, quarrelsome, revengeful, serpentine, troublesome, ungodly, violent, wicked, xenophobic, yielding to strive, zigzag. The Lord has cleansed us. The Lord has cleansed you. Give me a good amen now. We're looking at point number three now, permanent Mutual love in the family. Well, you come into First John chapter four, verse seventeen. First John chapter four, verse seventeen. Herein is a love made perfect. If you really want to practice love, start at home. Do it at home. Exalt that love at home. Because as you practice it at home, charity begins at home, love begins at home. When you go out, you will carry that spirit of love with you. Herein is a love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. Because as he is, so are we 
in this world, not as Cain, but as Christ. Not as Cain, but as Christ. As he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love. There is no fear in love. That's how you know whether you have love or not. When daddy comes home, do the children begin to tremble, quake, fearful? There's no fear in love. When mommy comes home, does the husband become fearful and jittery? There's no fear in love. When the children come back from school, are the parents afraid that it's going to be a tough time again? The boy has come back. The girl has come back. There's no fear in love. If there is love in the family, then all fear is gone. And the man, the husband, is not planning anything. I want them to fear me. I don't want all this uh, love, 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 and cheap love. I want them to tremble when I come in. I want them to see that I am a man, and I am a manly person, nothing like that. And the woman in the home is not saying, I want to, you know, put the man in his place. I want to keep him at a distance. I don't want him to be free and all that and at liberty. And, you know, ask me any question and check up this and check up that. And I'm going to make him afraid of me. That's not love. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear. Because fear has torment. Fear has torment. When you are frightened and fearful, you're tormented. And those who like other people to be frightened, other people to be fearful, they don't have love because all they are thinking about is themselves. They want to be high and they want to be, they want the man they are frightening to be like a ragged, you know, water so grat that to be hibernating in a corner. Fear has torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. If any man say, I love God, and hateth his brother, and hateth his wife, and hateth her husband, and hateth her children, and hateth members of the church, and hateth anyone, if any man say, I love God, and yet he hates his brother, he is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother, whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? The nearest person to you is your spouse, your partner, your wife, or your husband. And if you cannot love the nearest person to you, and the love we're talking about is not just word of mouth. You go to work, you go to sweat, you go to do something that will show you want to meet the needs of members of your family. That's love, practical love. And you exercise your skill. And when you get the money, you don't spend the money away from the family. You love the family and therefore you bring everything on the table. Actually, when we talk of single account, united account, between husband and wife, the best way to have done it will be you put all the money together and you make the woman the signatory so that it is not the man that is, you know, repositing the money, getting the money, withdrawing the money. You make her the manageress. 
And she is the one to bring out whatever you need, whatever she needs, whatever everybody needs in the family. That is selfless love, sacrificial love, not selfish, not thinking of yourself alone, not thinking of your needs alone, but you make sure that everything is open. There is no family account and then another private account except the business account, of course, through which you are generating the funds. And as the funds are generated, you show love by equitable distribution. Your children will be educated. Your children will be happy. Your parents will be happy. You know, I read uh, something, maybe you read it too, a mother asking uh, the son, my son, let's talk together. When I die, how are you going to bury me? Oh, the son said, mommy, trust me. I'll give you a befitting burial. Tell me what you'll do. I'm going to reserve at least five million naira, at least five million, and I, you, I will bury you, you over there where you are. You will rejoice. The mother said, "That's why I asked you. Don't do that. Give me four million five hundred thousand. Take care of me now." When I die, you can spend just 500,000, half of a million, that will be all right. You see, there are people, while their wives are alive, their husbands are alive, they don't take good care, they don't sacrifice, they don't give. While the children need them to be educated, they don't do the right thing, they're keeping the money. When the child who have not been feeding well, when he now gets sick, then we take large amount of money and we're spending on health care. Take care of them. Take care of the children. Take care of the wife. Take care of the husband. There will be love in our families. Verse 21, and this commandment have we from him that he who loveth God, tell me, love his brother also, love his sister also, love his wife also, love her husband also, love the children also, love the members of the church also. Amen. Amen. Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25. In Ephesians 5, verse 25, Osmans, love your wives, not as Cain, but as Christ. Even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Verse 28. So ought men to love their wives as their own body. Amen. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. How? When you love your wife, it will produce joy in her. And the joy of the Lord is her strength. When you love your wife, it will make her so happy there will be no depression. And the joy of the Lord and the love from the husband will make depression to be far away. When you love your wife, that love will be like a stimulant that will make her so happy and a merry heart is a good medicine. 
when you love your wife, she'll not be thinking of, when am I going to die? When am I going to leave this world? She wants to live long. And she has hope and she has faith and she's excited about living and your wife will live long. She will live as long as your amen. When you love your husband, your husband will be happy. There will be no depression and there will be nothing to cut short his life. Husband, wife, as you love each other, you will live long together in Jesus' name. And so, when your wife lives long, she'll be, she'll be alive to take care of you. You are helping yourself. When you make sure that everything you do to her does not make her to think of, you know, I was, it was better when I was not married. It was better when I was my mommy's home. It was better before this man hooked me and got me and now I'm there and I cannot, you know, leave the man. There'll be no negative thinking. There'll be positive thinking. When you love your wife and when you love your husband, things will change. Honeymoon will come back again. And courtship days will come back again. You know, our people don't want honeymoon to come back. They just say, Amen. Look at verse 29. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, even as the Lord the church. For we are members of his body, and of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. There will be no division in your family. There will be no divorce in your family. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife. Underline that word so. So love his wife. Look at that word so. So love his wife. You remember that word so. For God so loved the world. That he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have, tell me, everlasting life. Let every one of you so love his wife. If it happens that your wife is not physically around, so love your wife will mean that after tonight, you call your wife on the phone. Ah, honey, what's the problem? We talked yesterday, and you're calling me again today just to tell you I so love you. I can't hear my people. If your husband is not around in the physical you will take the phone tonight and you will call him. Any problem, my wife? No problem. Just like to talk to you. Just like to hear your voice. Because now, although I loved you, I've ever loved you, but now I so loved you, you will put that so in your love, in your family, in Jesus' name. Your family will be pleasant. Your family will be happy. And your family will live long. We live on love. I said we live on love. If you are on medication, and they tell you to take that medication every day, Maybe supplement, supplement every day. Peel every day. Don't be careless. Take that peel. And have you noticed if you are taking pills like that, when you miss out just a day, or you just forget two days, or maybe you travel out of town and you didn't take those pills with you carelessly, some funny things begin to happen in your body. And it appears that you're disorganized. 
And first of all, you will not know why is this happening here. You know? I eat well, I sleep well, I do this well and everything. Why is this? Then you remember, I've not taken those pills now for two days, for three days. And then when you come back home, you rectify all that uh, mistake. And you take it, uh, by the time you take it a day or two again, uh, life becomes normal. Your life will be normal. Let love be the daily pill and medicine that you take in your family. Serve each to each other. My wife, this is your pill. I so love you. My husband, this is your pill. I so love you. My wife, you didn't even ask for anything of research. What do you want? What am I going to buy for you? I'm going to go out. I'll do the shopping today. And I'll buy this and that. Because you so love your wife. And the same thing with the husband. You so love your husband. Life will change. Our members in our families will climb a higher mountain. And as you climb the mountain, you will have strength. You'll have vitality. You'll have energy. Because you brought the word so into the love of your family. Look at that verse 33. Nevertheless, let every one of you. How many of us? Tell me, tell me. Let every one of you in particular so love his wife, even as himself. And the wife see that she reverence her Husband. Point number four now. In point number four, profitable ministerial love for the flock. Profitable ministerial love for the flock. We're coming to First John chapter 3. And I'm reading from verse 16. First John chapter 3, verse 16. Hereby... Perceive we the love of God, because he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. The pastor, the preacher, the minister, the evangelist, the overseer, the leader, is the one to practice this first. Is the one to go ahead and lay down something for the members of the church, for the flock of God. You know what Jesus did? He laid down his reputation. He laid down his high position so that he can come over here on earth and uh, be our Savior. That's what the minister should do. The preacher should do. That's what the pastor should do. That we love the flock. We love the children of God. And we lay down. And we're not, you know, always demanding, hey, I'm the pastor here. Therefore, everybody shape up. I'm the pastor here. You must obey me. I'm the pastor here. You must do everything I say. Otherwise, I will drive, out of, I'll drive you out of my church. Sir, it is not your church. Whose church are we in? Christ's church. And so never say, my church, my church. Don't do this in my church. Don't do that in my church. Lay down your reputation. Philippians chapter 2. In Philippians chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 5. Let this might be you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but he made himself of no reputation. A minister will not be asking for, you know, respect me, love me, do this, do that. Maybe once in a while we will do that. But that will not be the center of our demand. We lay down our reputation. Like Jesus laid down his reputation. But he made himself of no reputation and took upon him 
the form of a servant and be made in the likeness of men and be found in fashion as a man. He humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. When Christ came to save us, he laid down his reputation. Lay down yours too. Second Corinthians chapter 8. And I'm reading from verse 9. Second Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9. For ye know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, Yet for your sakes it became poor. You see, that's what Christ did. And it says Christ laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. That's the love of the minister. That as Christ laid down everything he had, so he can be our savior. It says that he was rich, but he became poor that ye through his poverty might be rich. You want to reproduce that love of Christ. Second Corinthians chapter 5. In Second Corinthians chapter 5, I'm reading here from verse 14. Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14. For the love of God constraineth us. The motivation for our ministry and the motivation for loving the children of God, the flock of God, is the love of Christ compelling us. The love of Christ controlling us. The love of Christ constraining us because we thus judge with us understand that if one died for all, then we all dead. He became our substitute. He laid down his very life. Look at verse 15. And that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. It says we should no more now be living for what's in it for me? What can I get out of that? What's my profit? And what's my gain? What am I going to have? And when other people hurt us in the, you know, in the a church, maybe mistakenly, or maybe even carelessly, or maybe even deliberately. That's not the time to say, all right, I'm not going to, you know, serve the church anymore. I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to do that anymore. Like Christ, he endured all that for our salvation. You will endure all things for other people's salvation. I can't hear your Amen. Verse 18, and all things of God, who has reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and he has given us the ministry of reconciliation, to which that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and has committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you, we plead with you in Christ's stead. Be ye reconciled unto God. That's our ministry. That's your ministry. And you will carry it successfully through in Jesus' name. And that ministry, that work will prosper in your hand. It will prosper in my hand. Say it for yourself. It will prosper in our hands together in Jesus' name. Second Corinthians chapter 15. In Second Corinthians chapter 15, I'm reading from verse 14. 
Behold, the such time I am ready to come to you, and I will not be burdensome unto you. We pastors, we ministers, we overseers will not be burdensome on the flock. Paul the apostle said, you know Christ, it wasn't burdensome unto us. And the same way, we're not going to be burdensome unto the flock. It says, for the children ought not to lay up. For the parents, understand, it's talking about little, little children. They're not any money yet. They're not out of school yet. The parents are taking care of them. Because, you know, you remember the same apostle said as Paul. He said, those who have elderly parents, let them learn to take care of their parents and not put the body in on the church. So he's talking about, you're not in a position to provide for your parents yet. Your parents are providing for you. So he used that illustration for the pastors, for the overseers, for the ministers, for the parents, for the children. Look at verse 15. And I will very gladly spend and be spent for you. Let's read that together. And I will very gladly spend and be spent for you. Are you not there? Let's read it together. One, two, three, go. We don't serve grudgingly. You know, somebody brings food to the table. Maybe you go to a restaurant. And that uh, waitress or waiter, you know, has some challenges at home. And she carried that to the restaurant. And uh, she's serving you, but, you know, she's frowning. It's like the whole world is on her. You say, I don't know whether I want to come to that restaurant again. It makes you to lose appetite. Serve joyfully and serve gladly. I will very gladly spend and be spent for you. Though the more abundantly I love you, the less I be loved. You are love. I said you are love. That spirit of love will be multiplied, increased in every one of our lives in Jesus' name. Second Timothy chapter 1. Second Timothy chapter 1. I'm reading from verse 6. Wherefore, I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God, which is in you, in thee, by the putting on of my hands. <clears throat> we already have the anointing. I said, you already have the anointing. And it says, I'm putting you in remembrance. Stir it up, stir it up. That's the gift of God in you. And then it says, for God has not given us the spirit of for God has not given us I was waiting for you for God has not given us the spirit of fear but of power and of love and of a sound mind what spirit do you have spirit of power spirit of love Spirit of a sound mind. I said, what kind of spirit do you have? What spirit are you going to minister with? As you start up the gift of God in you, and you go to your congregation in the next meeting, something miraculous will happen. Love will flow. Pure love will flow. Fervent love will flow. Practical love will flow. And the work of God will grow in your hand in Jesus' name. You will not fear the flock. You will not fear the members. Because fear has torment. And perfect love casts out fear. No fear in your heart. I said no fear in your heart. 
No discouragement in your heart. Now you have the spirit of power. You have the spirit of love. And you have the spirit of, of a sound mind. The work of God continue to prosper in your hand. Let's rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer. Let's rise up now and talk to the Lord in prayer. Remember all that we have talked about today. That pure love. Meaningful love. Manifold love. That matured love. That love you minister to other people and you're not afraid. And you're not timid. Open your mouth and tell the Lord, Lord, give that to me. Lord, give that to me. And then not as Cain. Not as Cain. Not as Cain. Perverted. Love. Misplaced love. Mindless love. Mischievous love. Not as Cain. But as Christ. Tell the Lord. In your family, so love, your spouse will know that that love has an added soul. So love, so love, very thoughtful, very mindful. Meaningful, matured, acts like medicine, the lives of other people, and our profitable love, profitable in the church, to the flock, to all the members, profitable ministerial love that will build up the church, energize the church. Feed the church. Cast out fear in the church. That will make the church to grow to the measure of the fullness of the stature of Christ. Love one another.